Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, David Villar and uh, welcome to this uh, presentation on a topic that uh, experts say can threaten the very core of uh, modern medicine and the sustainability of any effective uh, medical response to the threat of infectious diseases. If you think about it, uh, we need antimicrobials not only to cure diseases, but to ensure that procedures like surgeries or chemotherapy can be provided at low risk. And as we will see, the problem lies in that we have been uh, really misusing and overusing antimicrobials in both humans and animals, and that really plays a major role in the development of uh, resistant organisms. And at the moment, we have very few uh, medications to replace them in the pipeline. So unless we want to head towards a post-antibiotic era in which uh, simple infections could once again uh, kill, uh, we really need to start using them in a more uh, judicious way to ensure that they will remain effective in the future. So I'm going to focus on the consequences of overusing antimicrobials. You see a picture of a pig, a cattle, and a chicken, uh, because these are the three main animal producing species in which they have and continue to be used uh, as uh, growth uh, promoters. Uh, and as you can see, the clinical implications for humans are uh, that we're going to have more uh, human uh, illnesses uh, with uh, treatment failures because of antimicrobial resistant organisms. Uh, examples could be uh, the increasing uh, resistance uh, by many zoonotic infection agents like uh, Salmonella, Campylobacter, E. coli, uh, which are linked to the use of antimicrobials uh, in, in animals. Uh, for example, uh, CDC is uh, constantly a warning of emerging strains of uh, Salmonella that come from animals and are already uh, multi-drug resistant because uh, we use the same antimicrobials in animals uh, that we need to treat ourselves. Uh, the same goes uh, for uh, increased uh, mortality. The predictions are that every year there is going to be more and more people ended up in the cemetery because they get sick uh, with one of these uh, multi-drug resistant bugs uh, for which there are really no uh, drugs left to be given or we may just uh, be too late in the course of the disease to save those people. Uh, obviously, increased cost may come from the need of additional treatment, longer hospitalizations, more diagnostic tests, and so on. Uh, when we talk about reduced efficacy of uh, related antibiotics, uh, I guess the classical example uh, was the use of avoparsin in animals as a growth uh, promoter. Uh, that was causing resistance to vancomycin, which is a glycopeptide uh, antimicrobial, uh, which is uh, used uh, sometimes as a last uh, line of defense against uh, resistant gram-positive bacteria. Uh, increased uh, carriage and dissemination of some resistant bacteria. Uh, here, the classical example is uh, methicillin-resistant uh, Staphylococcus aureus, uh, which can be maintained in livestock and can actually spread and transmit to humans and vice versa. This is definitely one of those uh, bacteria that you don't want to acquire in the intensive care unit if you have some type of uh, weakness or frailty of some type. Uh, so basically, uh, close contact with livestock is a risk factor for you to carry this type of bacteria. And finally, uh, facilitated emergence of resistant uh, basically, this uh, refers to the movement of uh, genes of resistance between bacteria. Uh, this is particularly relevant in the gastrointestinal tract, uh, which appears to be the ideal environment. And there are definitely uh, many studies showing movements of these uh, resistant genes from one type of bacteria, uh, you name it, E. coli to enterococci or listeria or salmonella and so forth. And selection of resistant bacteria is very likely to occur at sites like the gut or the skin microbiome. And even when you have a resolution of uh, an infection following an antimicrobial therapy, uh, you may have still created resistant bacteria in the normal flora. So just to show you an example of what I'm talking about, in 1997, the National Antimicrobial Resistant Monitoring System uh, that was launched a, a year earlier in the US they started monitoring the prevalence of resistance among, among Campylobacter in humans, and they concluded that this is a typical example of resistance that results from the use of antimicrobials in food animals, in this case, uh, chickens. And if we look at the graph in humans, the prevalence of resistant uh, Campylobacter was uh, 13% in 1997, and, and it went up to uh, 19% in 2001. 
and the first uh, fluoroquinolones were approved for use in poultry in 1995. So the conclusion from these uh, surveillance studies, as you can imagine, were that the use of fluoroquinolones in chicken were compromising the use of this uh, important class of antimicrobials in humans. And because people uh, who uh, seek medical attention were probably um, uh, were uh, prescribed uh, fluoroquinolones were likely not responding so well to the medication. Uh, finally, FDA uh, decided not to approve uh, enrofloxacin for poultry any longer, and that was uh, done back in uh, 2000. So the issue of uh, antimicrobial resistance is something that worries all the major health uh, authorities. Uh, here you can see all the three main world uh, health organizations that, ha that have uh, come together. And they put uh, a global action plan uh, uh, that was launched in 2015. And they're trying to address this uh, challenge of antimicrobial resistance uh, through a One Health approach, in which they basically have everyone involved, not just the healthcare professionals. And if we look at this uh, action plan in more detail, it has uh, five major uh, strategic objectives. Uh, the number one is to improve awareness and understanding of antimicrobial uh, resistance, uh, obviously uh, through communication, education, training. Uh, the second one is to strengthen knowledge and evidence uh, through more uh, surveillance and research. Uh, obviously, we need to know what's uh, happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Third one is to reduce the incidence of infection through effective sanitation, hygiene, and prevention measures. Uh, quite simple, if we lower the occurrence of disease, uh, the pressure to use antimicrobials uh, can be similarly uh, reduced. Uh, the fourth one, uh, which is uh, to optimize the use of antimicrobials in humans and animal health. Uh, this one uh, will be the one that we'll focus on, on later videos. Uh, but, but when we uh, refer to the optimal use, uh, we're not just talking about achieving uh, maximal uh, clinical efficacy as uh, we have always done, but nowadays uh, we have to include balancing uh, such efficacy with a minimal risk of creating uh, antimicrobial resistance. Uh, and not only in the strain which is causing the infection, but also in the patient's uh, normal or commensal uh, microbiota. I know this is uh, easier said than done, but uh, there are better ways of using antimicrobials that uh, will help reduce this uh, resistance uh, from happening. And finally, to develop the economic case for a sustainable investment that takes account of uh, the needs of all the countries and to increase the investment in new medicines, diagnostic tools, vaccines, and whatever uh, interventions uh, we can come up with. So as I mentioned in future videos, uh, we will address how to make better use of antimicrobials uh, to prevent uh, resistance. Uh, but the first thing that we should know is uh, what is actually driving or causing most of that resistance. Uh, because obviously the concept of implementing optimal uh, use evolves around knowing what causes it in the first place. Uh, so uh, we're going to divide it in, into three things. And uh, the first one is uh, obviously uh, going to start by reducing the overall volume of antimicrobials. And this one, we could uh, simply start by saying that uh, having better regulation and oversight of the sales and use, uh, particularly in countries where they, they can be easily attained over the counter uh, and there are no control efforts and let alone any surveillance uh, regarding how they use it in food animals, uh, could be a, a good start. Uh, the second one would be to stop using it as a growth uh, promotion. Uh, believe it or not, uh, the vast amount of antimicrobials are not used for, for therapeutic purposes, but really for uh, growth uh, promotion, uh, particularly in pigs and poultry. Uh, we have these uh, factory farming systems in which we keep animals confined and we dose them constantly with antimicrobials. Uh, not only to keep them disease-free, but to make them uh, gain weight faster. And if you'd like to read more on, on this issue, uh, this uh, guideline here uh, by uh, WHO uh, is excellent on the overall uh, use of uh, medically important antimicrobials in food-producing animals. I'll make this uh, article available uh, on VetMed Academy and also on the reference list at the end of uh, this presentation. 
But uh, in a nutshell, what they uh, advocate is to uh, uh, totally restrict or discontinue the use of antimicrobials as uh, growth uh, promoters. Uh, the second thing is to uh, not use antimicrobials uh, for disease uh, prevention in healthy animals. And also the third thing is uh, not to use antimicrobials, which are uh, critically important for humans in food producing animals, unless there is no other better option uh, indicated by a susceptibility test. So this is not only a World Health Organization, but also all the medical associations that are in line with these uh, guidelines. So just to show you uh, an example of what I'm talking about, uh, the more tetracycline that it was uh, used on this study as a growth promoter in cattle, the more uh, resistant E. coli that they uh, detected on their uh, gastrointestinal tract. So obviously reducing in, in general, the overall consumption of antimicrobials uh, will, in of itself, uh, reduce the level of uh, resistant bacteria. Now, the problem is that there are very few countries in the world taking really uh, measures to do so. And I'm going to blow up this uh, second graph here so you can see it better. At least uh, Europe and uh, the U.S. seem to be doing the right thing. But if we look at countries like uh, China, Brazil, and India, the projections are that they will almost double their use of antimicrobials by, by the year 2030 uh, for livestock. And this is mostly as uh, growth uh, promoters, obviously. In Europe, uh, the use of antimicrobials uh, as a growth uh, promotion was officially banned in 2001. And uh, Denmark has become actually the international leader in the fight against antimicrobial resistance. Uh, they do uh, monitor all the sales and resistant uh, trends in humans and animals. And the funny thing is that uh, by removing antimicrobials as uh, growth uh, promoters in pigs, uh, they, they show no negative consequences on uh, profits. At the very beginning, they showed some increases in uh, post-winning diarrhea, uh, which uh, requires some interventions in uh, changes in feeding and uh, winning procedures. But basically, their models are outstanding, very competitive, and they are doing really well after the ban. So uh, how about the regulation in the U.S.? Well, uh, between 2014 and 2016, the FDA implemented a voluntary plan with industry uh, to phase out antimicrobials. And it didn't really seem to work out uh, because... Uh, as you can see on this table, the tons of uh, medically important anti antibiotics uh, for use in food animals uh, continue to increase. Uh, so basically, at the start of 2017, all the medically important antimicrobials uh, were no longer allowed for uh, use as uh, growth uh, promotion. And the base and on all the uses had to be used for a clear uh, therapeutic uh, purposes uh, with uh, veterinary uh, supervision whether it was uh, to treat uh, animals uh, that exhibited a clinical disease or animals in which uh, morbidity or mortality had exceeded a certain baseline or for prevention when the risk uh, was too high of becoming sick. And as I said before, uh, WHO is even uh, recommended not using the critically important antimicrobials for disease treatment and control unless there is a specific uh, susceptibility test that demonstrate that this is really the only drug option uh, available. So what are those uh, critically important antimicrobials? Well, here we have a, a list by FDA uh, of medically important antimicrobials, uh, which are, uh, as you can see, ranked uh, by a group of experts into uh, cri critically, uh, highly important, important, and uh, non-medically important. And as you can imagine, the last ones, uh, which are, the uh, at least in the U.S., the ones that remain to be used as uh, growth uh, promoters. And I guess probably the main category here are the ionophores, uh, which are obviously not used in uh, human medicine. And uh, this FDA list is very similar to the classification by uh, WHO, which I know it's uh, very difficult to uh, see on this slide here, uh, but basically most of uh, both uh, lists are 
uh, virtually identical. Uh, I just wanted to show you this uh, this other one by that was put together by uh, WHO in 2016. And as you can imagine, the idea is to preserve those antimicrobials that are uh, considered of most uh, importance uh, for humans, and that should be uh, used as a li last line of defense, if you like, in life-threatening uh, situations. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, it, the, they recommend to uh, that when you plan on using antimicrobials, to do so with, uh, based on uh, what the laboratory is telling you, uh, with a susceptibility uh, test, and uh, always try to preserve those that are, uh, that are of uh, most importance uh, for human medicine. So, which are those uh, that are most important? Well, if we go to uh, back to the FDA list, uh, just remember that uh, uh, the fluoroquinolones, the macrolides, and the third and fourth generation cephalosporins are really the ones that should be preserved as a last resource, so to speak, uh, and when there are no better options uh, available. We can also reduce antimicrobials in other type of applications like uh, prophylaxis or uh, metaphylaxis. Uh, in this respect, uh, we will have uh, uh, some videos uh, showing specific examples like doing better diagnostics in weaning of uh, piglets, uh, which can help us reduce the use of antimicrobials to, uh, to treat diarrhea. Uh, we will also present how we can uh, precondition your calves uh, before uh, transportation uh, by doing a good vaccination and weaning programs so that uh, we don't need to treat them when they arrive to a feedlot. Uh, we will also uh, present uh, some alternatives uh, to dry cow therapy, which uh, don't involve the use of antimicrobials. And there are a lot of uh, different conditions in small animal practice, uh, which uh, we tend to overuse or misuse antimicrobials, which are also a good opportunity to reduce the overall uh, uh, use of antimicrobials in general. And uh, finally, uh, avoiding unnecessary therapy. Uh, this can always uh, be done by uh, preventing and controlling infections. Uh, Obviously, uh, good management, vaccination, biosecurity, this is always the best way to reduce the need of using antimicrobials. So when we refer to uh, the drug type uh, driving resistance, uh, basically we're talking about using uh, antimicrobials without any uh, laboratory backup uh, to tell us what uh, the susceptibility of that bacteria is. Uh, we should probably start relying more on laboratories to tell us what to use instead of uh, doing empirical uh, treatment, uh, especially when we use drugs that are uh, critically important uh, by uh, WHO standards. And uh, just to remind you which ones those are, remember uh, fluoroquinolones, uh, macrolides, and third and fourth generation cephalosporin. So on this uh, second point, basically, is just to highlight the importance of starting using laboratories to tell us uh, what drugs uh, we should be using and try to move away from uh, doing empirical uh, treatments. And the final point, which has really been a major shift from the way it's been done for decades, is that the latest uh, trend is that uh, treatment should be avoided after clinical resolution of symptoms. Uh, because the longer the treatments, the greater the chances of developing resistance on the commensal microbiota. As I say, this has really uh, changed from the way it used to be. Uh, now the doctor may tell you to stop taking the medication when you feel much better, and not until it was initially uh, prescribed for. So that's uh, a trend that has really changed in, in the last uh, years. As a final thought, how do we uh, translate everything that we just said into uh, practical guidelines that could be uh, used in our day-to-day -day practice? Well, obviously, uh, we need to focus on animal species and disease-specific uh, recommendations. Uh, we should probably highlight the current practices, uh, which may be incorrect, or where we may need to do further testing uh, to implement an optimal antimicrobial use. So we will uh, try try to address these in future videos. So I'm going to uh, wrap up here. These are the references that I used to uh, 
prepared this uh, video. I hope this uh, initial uh, presentation was useful to set up the stage. So until next uh, video, I'm just going to uh, dismiss you here. So bye-bye and uh, take care. Bye-bye.